Hello everybody and welcome to HT2201 Theories of Contemporary Architecture and um, this week we're going to be exploring uh, the paradigm of circulatory systems building on last week's work on new materialities. So uh, let's go ahead. Okay, uh, we're going to start by setting out a problem, or the terms of a problem, which we're going to explore. Behind me is the website of Snowetta. You're probably familiar with Snowetta, um, you know, one of the most productive contemporary architectural uh, design firms uh, in the world. Now, one of their uh, recent projects is Ryerson University Student Centre. It has all the hallmarks of, um, you know, successful, kind of trendy, fashionable, respectable, um, uh, award-winning piece of architecture. And the photos here show a highly convivial, interactive kind of a space. People chilling out on the steps, um, having a nice time, dramatic, formal moves, kind of sculpted facade, opening up the building, the institution, um, as it were, to the public streets, kind of gesture of uh, invitation to encourage circulation from the street uh, into the insides of the buildings. Um, you can do parkour on the building, um, a, a sure sign that it's a contemporary work of architecture. It has this you know, nice kind of pattern work facade, and um, the emphasis seems to be on um, openness, inclusivity, um, kind of relaxed social mixing and, uh, and condensing and I guess uh, kind of open spaces for open networked forms of social life and learning. Um, well, earlier on, uh, or I should say last year, um, during the um, during thesis, um, two uh, contemporary thinkers uh, came to SIARC to uh, to contribute some of their work, Amy Hamrai and Kelly Fritsch, the authors of one of the texts that you read for this week, um, uh, the Crypt Techno Science Manifesto, and in their lecture about um, disability and design, they played um, the following excerpt from a very interesting live uh, reading or critique of the Ryerson University um, Centre that we've just seen um, by a blind man. And let's just um, uh, look at, uh, at this video and, um, and grasp the, uh, a different kind of reading uh, or a new reading of the space um, uh, uh, following our guide here. Finally, find the handrail on the right side of this bizarre column. It doesn't lead me up the stairs to the landing. Instead, it loops me past the top of the column and back down the adjacent stairs. There are stairs with angled railings outside the building going up to the front door. The main lobby staircase goes up two floors. Railings divided into four parallel sets of stairs. The right handrail is skewed to the left cutting in front of a person as they walk up the stairs. The left handrail is at a skewed angle too. If you hold the railing like I did, your feet are guided in the wrong direction. This is a tripping hazard for blind people and for those with balance issues. Staircase railing should never be angled. Designers may think it looks cool, but it creates safety and accessibility problems. On the sixth floor is a room called the beach area for students to hang out and study. Stairs go from the front of the room up to the back of the room. There's a landing between each short flight of stairs. The stairs don't follow a straight path from the front of the room to the back. Speeding up the video, see how lost I get? Ramps. Here's an outside ramp to get from the street level to the building's front entrance, one floor up. The ramp's route is quite a maze. Normally, Ramps follow a simple pattern, a straight line or switchback. That outdoor ramp has no railing. 
People with balance issues need a railing. I need one to follow a maze-like ramp. Angled pillars. Nothing should ever protrude at any height into a path of travel. No pillars should ever lean at an angle. When I go up the outdoor ramp from street level to the front door, there's a leaning pillar on my left side. My shoulder brushes right up against it. When I take that exterior elevator to the ground floor and walk outside, there's a leaning pillar in my path. I hit my head right near my right ear. It's troubling that this building won architectural awards. Here's a web page announcing that it received the Canadian Architect 2011. So, uh, as you can see there, that video stages um, a rather kind of dramatic antagonism uh, or sort of conflict between uh, what we might say is um, formalism and access. The building is uh, you know, constituted out of a series of kind of bold, relatively bold, um, formal gestures. But let's be frank, um, not nearly as bold as the, uh, the kind of standard move in a, um, in a PSYARC 2GBX uh, studio. And uh, a conflict between that kind of bold formal invention and the, uh, the real lived experience of users. And it shows that um, every kind of formal invention potentially has uh, social consequences for the way that somebody can move around the building. Now, um, my point here is not really to judge that building one way or another, but it's rather to uh, use that, that scenario to set up this contention um, uh, between kind of formalism and access and to use that as a basis to approach the problem of circulatory systems um, in architecture. Not, as I said, to uh, necessarily judge architecture, but rather to set up uh, what I hope is a productive antagonism um, between form and circulation. Now, you know, just want to acknowledge briefly that the the problem or the question or the paradigm of circulation um, in architecture is, of course, um, ancient and more or less universal. Um, take the mortuary temple of Queen Hatshepsut um, from ancient Egypt, and you see um, a work of arch architecture absolutely defined by the way it is to be navigated, by the way that circulation happens in this monumental processional ceremonial uh, progress up the axial center of the site through the sequence of monumental ramps. And you see an architecture which um, it, uh, emerges absolutely um, uh, out of the uh, imposition of a circulatory system. Um, we're, uh, we're not going to delve too deeply into that kind of ancient history, but we are going to set up a disciplinary History. I'm going to put forward um, a set of uh, kind of case studies here um, with, uh, I guess it's three main um, scenarios in which um, circulatory systems uh, impose themselves as a massively generative uh, force, both in built projects but also in um, theory. And so uh, the work that you read this week by Bernard um, Schumi, um, Amy Hamry and Kelly Fritch, uh, Claude Parron, um, and um, also, if you looked at it, the uh, Madeleine Gins and uh, Arakawa texts. They're all dealing with the question of um, can a new architecture emerge out of a new body and of a new way of moving? And can these two things, the architecture and movement, work together antagonistically but productively to produce um, a new world? And that is really the question where we want to get to, which is to think, in our contemporary moment now, where do we stand um, or sit in relation to the uh, problematic of circulation and architecture? Or another way to say it um, is the relationship between um, program and form. So these terms, we're gonna, they're going to crop up and we'll get into them uh, more. But 
you know, just to, to like, set a little, uh, another kind of foundation stone here in uh, early modernism, you know, one of the great m modernist uh, kind of industrial buildings here, the Van Nella factory by Brinkman and van der Vlucht, um, it was a, uh, a factory in the Netherlands for processing um, comestibles and um, has these beautiful and extraordinary um, uh, ramps. Um, some of them are for processing goods, others of them are for processing uh, workers. So the ramp um, in modernism in the early 20th century began to take on a kind of heroic status. And um, one of the architects to take up that heroic status uh, of the ramp of the circulatory element was, of course, uh, Corbusier in the Carpenter Centre here in Cambridge, where the, um, the ramp, as Shumi says, um, is where a genuine movement of body is made into an architectural solid, or possibly the, reser the reverse, that a solid forcibly channels the movement of bodies. So we see in these ramps um, this strong relationship between um, an architecture, a concrete architectural form, and the movement uh, of bodies around it. And you see that this slope here is effectively um, you know, redeploying the kinds of processional logic um, that were already there in the mortuary temple of uh, Queen Hatshepsut. Um, the Mill Owners Association building in uh, Ahmedabad from the 1950s by Corbusier equally deploying uh, this, um, this ramp. And I mean, earlier and perhaps uh, more famous, you know, the Villa Savoie, defined internally by, uh, you can see it here in section, by this ramp that um, slopes up from the ground floor uh, onto the garden terrace and uh, the roof. And you see it there very centrally in the plan of the building, um, uh, producing this um, uh, navigatory scheme. You see an internal shot there. And what it also means is that here, circulation um, is staged from the garden, uh, from the roof terrace here. Um, you can view uh, the spectacle of movement, the body moving up through space becomes something which is to be staged within the, um, the interior courtyard. And um, you know, Corbusier was very explicit about this celebration of circulation, the celebration of the body and movement, um, this uh, deployment of architecture as a stage for uh, the production of modern subjects. And um, in Corbusier's kind of uh, uh, propaganda, let's say, um, in text and with cin cinema, um, he very carefully staged his buildings um, and populated them with uh, scripted scenarios. Um, and we'll see one uh, here. Uh, let's just switch if we can. Mm, yep. I think that'll do it. Okay, yeah. Let's look at uh, this a film of another one of Corbusier's villas, which shows you these spaces uh, in use by a kind of uh, supposedly ideal modern subject. And, you know, who doesn't feel like doing squat jumps when you see a Corbusier? Um, there's clearly an idea that Corbusier wanted to put forward about the relationship between a certain kind of uh, ideal, from his point of view, modern body and architecture that the two are inextricable, that um, uh, these kind of open sunlit courtyards and um, stairways, they uh, invite exercise um, as an expression um, of health and, uh, and indicate um, indicate what is a uh, what architecture can do the kinds of bodies it can produce and the kinds of experiences that it can stage and uh, cultivate 
Well, um, you know, another um, architect who sort of took up this problem, but in a rather different way, and perhaps a more um, uh, uh, challenging way, was uh, Claude Perron, a French uh, draftsman and architect, um, whose work was uh, just a couple of years ago um, exhibited at SIARC. So someone who is, uh, in a way, quite close to us, um, and, and has been in the air around SIARC. And um, you may well know uh, Perron's work. Um, defined, uh, among other things, by uh, this sort of fundamental concept, uh, vivre à l'oblique, to, to live, living on the oblique. And the oblique meaning, as the simple um, diagram on uh, the page shows, uh, not the horizontal, on an inclined plane, an oblique plane. And along with the, uh, the French theorist Paul Virilio, Claude Perron developed um, an extremely well wor worked out idea of what it would mean uh, to live um, on the oblique. And, um, and to sort of explain uh, uh, all of the things that this uh, that this meant. So, in order to um, in order to sort of in investigate this idea of what is living on the oblique, what is oblique architecture, what kind of a circulatory system does it produce? Um, let's just look at some of the work of um, Claude Perron that we've been reading here, and hopefully you'll be able to see behind me um, <clears throat> some of the text. Uh, that was on the reading list uh, today. And we'll just uh, highlight some key uh, parts of it here. Um, so this is all from Architecture uh, Principe, which is a collection of uh, writings by Paul Perron and Paul uh, Virilio. And um, uh, we're going to pick out a few key concepts here. Now, um, you know, in general, what Perron was uh, interested in and what he was repeatedly arguing for was that he wanted architecture to produce a metamorphosis of immediate consciousness that would result in the toppling over of all sensible givens um, and lead to an elementary transformation of the notion of dimension. So he was after a fundamental shift in the way that people experienced space. Um, toppling over all sensible givens, changing the way um, that you sense the world. So the first point about uh, oblique architecture is that it's a change of dimension, a change in the way that uh, you experience space. And uh, for Perron, there, was, um, there were a number of kind of symbols or metaphors um, or figures drawn from the natural world uh, which helped him describe the new regime of movement um, that he wanted to, um, uh, to bring in. And waves, um, waves were one of these uh, phenomena, uh, a way of visualizing a new kind of space and a new way of uh, navigating space. He thought of waves as, uh, or architecture, as a petrified movement of ascent, meaning you know, petrifica petrification, meaning turning into stone, um, a, a kind of um, petrified wave, this arresting uh, of the movement and the energy of the wave, something which is liquid and fluid and dynamic, um, as being a uh, potential model for architecture. Um, well, let's just um, hear Perron uh, speak about this. And, um, you know, Perron um, actually came to SIARC um, to lecture um, early on. I think it was in the, I don't know, the, maybe it was the 80s. And um, this here is a, a, sh a short film uh, from the SIARC channel about the exhibition of Claude Perron's drawings that was at um, SIARC. And it includes a snippet of when um, Perron came to lecture um, at the school. So let's just uh, listen to hear what he says 
about the wave and the wave as a, um, uh, as a kind of fundamental expression of his vision of what architecture might be like. The movement of the mer vers la côte is an illusion. That the movement of the ocean towards the shore is an illusion. And that the only real movement is this one. And that the only real movement is this one. Here, là, là, là. Here, here, here. Au moment où ça va tomber. Right at the time where it's going to fall. Et j'ai décidé dans ma petite tête d'architecte de me mettre là. And I decided in my little head of architect to position myself there. Là, c'est mon territoire. Here is my territory. Okay. So, uh, the wave, um, being on the edge of the wave, the tip of the wave, this is the ideal uh, territory uh, to be in. This is where architectural experience uh, can be uh, most extreme. And you can see in Perron's um, drawings and diagrams, each one of these little figures is um, kind of positioned as you saw surfing on the edge of that wave are suspended over the void at that moment of highest potentiality where um, they're, they're, they're not in a relaxed state, they're in a dynamic position um, ready to move. And you, know, you also see that the topology of the wave makes its way into Perron's um, dramatic sketches. Here, in, in this case, a whole network of interlocking um, waves and um, uh, oblique shapes And again here, you see these people living, as it were, at the intersection of crashing waves. Um, now, the... Where are we? Okay. The consequences um, of this... Uh, of this uh, move is um, to tackle the problem of the incompatibility between stance and circulation. So Perrault had identified that in the way that cities and architecture had previously been conceived and built, there was an incompatibility between stance, just standing there, being in the world, being stationary, and circulation, moving around the world. And so um, he found that the modern city, as it currently existed, um, was incapable of mastering fluidity, this condition of circulation and movement, which he so, um, he so valuable. Well, uh, to deal with this and um, to kind of move architecture forward, um, Perrault's uh, kind of claim was that man had to take possession of himself more intensely. And I mean, you can probably sense in a lot of Perrault's uh, writing, and you know, if you if you look at Perrault and um, and well, as we've just seen in his video, there's definitely a sense of a, a kind of modernist heroic masculinity um, that's in undeniably uh, involved here. In this idea that one has to experience the world intensely. One has to be on that wave. And in doing so, to call into question the relations of man to his environment. And I think this is the absolutely key point um, uh, to really reinforce here, is that by um, producing a condition of disequilibrium, I think we, yeah, here he speaks a lot of, well, instabilization or disequilibrium, by putting people in a state of uh, disequilibrium, then that would uh, that would fundamentally call into question the relations of man to his environment, and I think this is uh, how we want to approach uh, Perrault's work and to use it within this context overall um, of uh, circulatory systems to think that. Um, 
in order to advance, the state of architecture must be called into question. And I think one of Perron's, um, you know, kind of uh, great motivations and obsessions was how do you jerk people out of their state of acceptance and complicity with the way the world is, with all of its wrongs and shortcomings? And how do you um, uh, use space, use material, use architecture to um, destabilize people? And Perron's kind of impetus was to start with the body to change the way that people move around space and thereby to in, induce new forms of consciousness, new forms of society, new forms of politics, new forms of life. So this very, very direct relationship for Paul Perron between um, the navigation of space and um, the nature of life. Um, Perron had... Uh, by the by, he had a um, you know, particular interest in uh, the domestic, and you see here some sketches um, for sort of furniture. And Perron, you know, for Perron, the, the distinction between furniture and architecture basically dissolved. And um, it was all what he called um, uh, cir circulation habitable, habitable circulation. The whole of architecture should be for circulation, for moving around, and it should all also be habitable. You should be able to live on it. And um, Perron, um, in fact, did, um, did uh, install in his own house an oblique uh, space. And let's just uh, listen here to uh, Chloe Perron, uh, Claude Perron's uh, daughter, who visited Sayoc and... Um, described what it was like uh, to live in this space. And you can see this is the, uh, this is the Sayoc Library, and we reconstructed um, part of the, um, the oblique architecture furniture in the library. So let's just listen to this. Uh, my name is Chloe Parent, and I'm the daughter of architect Claude Parent and he decided to transform our house into an oblique function experiment. It was really fun and it was also very comfortable. It was not static, it was dynamic. You could use all the space above and below the ramps. You could read under a ramp in a little space that my dad was calling a espace pensé, which is like a pinched space. The dining table was really enjoyable. You could sit anywhere you wanted. You could lie down. You could turn and to watch TV, which was on the other side of the ramps. You could even sit on the table if you wanted. It was really something that I would like more people to experience. So you see that Perron works um, at a whole variety of scales, um, from the domestic to, uh, to the landscape. And um, we won't go into this now, but I just point out um, actually, a lot of the origin for this thinking um, came in Perron's um, collaborative work with Paul Virilio um, immediately after the end of the Second World War. You have to remember, um, at this time, 1945, the end of the war, um, northern France especially, totally um, devastated by the effects of uh, war. It also uh, had been... Um, uh, had, had built on it... Uh, a vast amount of military architecture by the Germans during the occupation in particular. And um, a lot of this were this um, thick concrete sort of bomb-proof uh, machine gun bunkers all along um, the north coast. And Claude Perron and Paul Virilio undertook a survey, what they called a bunker archaeology, of these, um, uh, of these uh, sort of ruins and um, that became a lot of the impetus for uh, some of their collaborative projects. 
one of the most important uh, built examples of which uh, was the church at Nevers. And um, one of the buildings which put into practice some of these ideas about an oblique architecture. And you see that what defines um, that church is, um, uh, is the, that it has this raised up congregational floor where the two sides, these two wings, um, are split and sloped to one another um, to produce this very dramatic um, intersectional uh, form in which both sides of the congregation of the church are, are kind of living together in their intense uh, spiritual experience on the oblique uh, against one another. Okay, so there we have um, uh, Perron, who is working through um, many kinds of media, drawings at different scales, diagrams, photography projects, as well as built work, in order to um, uh, define a new kind of architecture, a new way of moving through space, life on the uh, oblique. Now, that work was um, extremely influential, particularly within um, uh, French circles. And uh, one of the architects um, who took up some of these um, ideas um, direct, more or less um, directly uh, was Bernard Schumi. And um, Schumi is someone um, for us to think about, uh, particularly because um, uh, Shimi will be coming to uh, lecture at SIOC at some point um, this year. So I thought this would be a good way uh, for us to prepare ourselves um, for, that, for that visitation. Well, let's take an example of a work by Shimi, um, such as the, uh, the Learner Center at Columbia University, a building that some of you may be um, familiar with. And it... Um, it's an intervention within, as you may know at Columbia, in a way a very kind of conservative red brick uh, atmosphere. This is the facade the building presents to um, uh, the, the street, whatever it is. Is it Broadway there? I'm, I can't remember. But when you go into the campus, um, the building then opens up this uh, transparent facade to show you what is being exhibited um, to the interior of the campus, as it were. Well, it's this uh, catwalk, um, the, uh, the circulatory apparatus, um, here actually being used for a performance. Um, but the ramp that uh, runs uh, up through the building and is uh, one of its main circulation uh, systems is displayed very, very prominently as the public interface between uh, the building um, and the public. And you see, uh, you can see here in the interior of the shot, the, uh, the glass, the, um, uh, the glass curtain kind of facade there. And then you have this exhibitionary catwalk and then this atrium void. And then um, behind that, as you can see here, it has uh, a theater, that's the main program in the centre of the building. But uh, what is most visible and the, the spectacle of the building is the uh, catwalk circulation system. Now, um, what was it for Shimi that, um, that made this so significant? And, um, um, and what constituted, what was the nature of this spectacle? And um, how did Shumi understand it to function? And what kind of an architecture um, did it, uh, did it um, uh, produce? Well, um, if we look at uh, Shumi's um, work, you know, this will help us, I think, conceptualize what kind of a space that is. Um, and this is from the, uh, uh, the collection of essays um, that, you, that, uh, that you have to read um, this week, or selections of which. And it was from Architecture of Limits. 
Um, it's a section in which Shumi begins to enumerate the sensory aspects and qualities of, uh, of architecture. He speaks about the pervasive smells of the materials, the taste of the dust, the, uh, the feel of the rubbing of an elbow on an abrasive surface, and the kind of full body pleasure and experience um, which constitute um, architecture. But most of all, he spends time to describe the spaces of movement, the corridors, staircases, ramps, passages, thresholds. This is where um, it begins the articulation between the spaces of the senses and the spaces of society. Um, so the body and the senses of the body and the way that the sensing body moves through space is uh, positioned by Shumi as the beginning of architectural speculation. It's where um, uh, the self, the individual, and their senses start to become socialized and part of a larger uh, corporate body. Um, Shumi's theory of the body is that bodies not only move in, but generate spaces produced by and through the movements. And this is really fundamental. This is a circulatory theory of architecture, um, that it begins with the body. The body is the primary center of sensing. It's the center of movement. And from the movement of the body, space unfolds and gets generated. Now, uh, <clears throat> this would uh, lead Shumi to pick up on uh, a fundamental uh, quality and concept in architecture, which, uh, which Shumi would put at the very forefront um, of his work, and that is the concept of uh, program. And here it begins with a very dry definition of what program is, a list of required utilities indicating their relation um, but not their combination or proportion. So program, the utility is required uh, by the building and their uh, uh, relations. But Shumi is quick to uh, qualify this, um, to talk about programmatic concerns, um, uh, not just as functionalist, functionalist doctrine, not just form uh, follows function. Um, but he does use this to set up a debate, and this is for us, I think, to pay attention to, um, a debate um, that kind of attacks the preeminence of formal manipulation. And this is part of the reason why I think it's crucial for us um, to think about now and today and where we are, to interrogate this idea of formal manipulation, just play with forms, making forms of any old shape, um, trying to produce exuberant new stylistics. Shumi uh, kind of critiques that, or at least sets it in tension with um, social or utilitarian considerations. Uh, and these uh, get grouped for him um, under uh, programmatic concerns. Um, you know, architecture may... Um, the purpose of architecture may be to generate new forms, but it can also be, um, as Shumi points out, to create new programs. Um, and he lists some of these that were produced at the beginning of the 20th century, social condensers, communal kitchens, workers' clubs, factories. Um, each of these was a new, gave a new program to society. It was a new vision of social and th familial uh, structure. This can also be the work of architecture to produce new programs, new um, ways of being in space. Now, I'm just going to kind of gloss over a few more of the qualifications that Shumi um, adds to these ideas. One of the fundamental ideas here is, um, is of uh, violence. And this is you know, perhaps a kind of troubling way for Shumi to have put it, but that's um, the, the word he used. But to be distinguished from kind of sheer uh, brutality, violence for Shumi is instead the intensity of a relationship 
between individuals and their surrounding uh, spaces. Also, the inseparability of space and action. So, um, uh, I think the reason why uh, Shumi refers to uh, the violence of space is because when one speaks of the human body as entering into a space, Shumi thinks of it as a violation, an entry, a disturbance. And this is um, uh, important to uh, understand the energy, the dynamics that exist uh, between a body and uh, a space. And this is something just for us to kind of carry through. Um, yes, uh, the violence that all individuals inflict on the spaces by their very presence, by their intrusion into the controlled order of architecture. So if architecture had always been something historically which had been controlled and ordered, if we now foreground the idea of the body and the body's movement and circulation, this presents a violation, an energy, a disruptive potentiality, an instability, as Perron uh, was saying. And the point is that bodies then carve all sorts of new and unexpected spaces through fluid or erratic motions. So the body might interest us um, as architects for the way that it circulates and for the new and unexpected things that it does, and therefore the challenge it presents to any kind of established conventional um, architectural order and authority and governance and everything that follows um, from that. Uh, you know, if you want it uh, short and sweet, there is no space without event. This is a theory of architecture, an approach to architecture where we cannot conceive of space without thinking of the events that take place. We can't think of a form without considering um, a body and uh, how it moves. And so um, that boils down to a whole theory of architecture, which is um, architecture as inhabited. Remember Claude Perron, habitable circulation. Everything um, is inhabited with sequences of events use, activities, incidents, always uh, imposed on those fixed uh, spatial um, sequences. And just uh, one last uh, point is that when you, uh, when you think of program, when you put program um, at the forefront of your consideration of architecture, um, this allows for three possible permutations. Um, uh, in uh, about the relationship between events and spaces. Um, one is indifference, which is that the events that take place um, in a space are independent of one another. Um, Shumi gives the example of uh, the Crystal Palace, um, a huge kind of exhibitionary uh, uh, structure in which all kinds of different things happen. Just a shed, a container, um, which is totally indifferent to uh, anything that happens within it. Um, a second permutation is reciprocity, which is that the spaces and events um, are interdependent and they um, condition each other. And uh, the last is uh, conflict, where the events and spaces um, clash and contradict with one another. And he gives this nice linguistic example of the battalion, you know, the military unit skates on the tightrope. And this idea of conflict, which is also uh, relates to the idea of uh, violence before, I think is the one which perhaps for Shumi um, was the most uh, productive to think about the productive conflicts that can exist between spaces and circulatory uh, systems. And so uh, we might think of the Learner Centre as an example of this, um, you know, an educational facility that um, uh, as a space is sort of in conflict with this uh, catwalk um, exhibitionary quality of the event 
that takes place within it, this display um, of the body in movement. Perhaps even more obvious um, is this unbuilt uh, project for the National Library um, of France, where the primary program was a library, um, but where uh, Shumi's proposal is that the library should also be an athletics uh, uh, facility. So that uh, here we have superimposed on one another two conflicting programs or an event um, or, or a space, the typology of a library, which has superimposed upon it a conflicting um, event, which is um, uh, running athletics. And these two uh, these two programs enter into um, uh, a kind of dynamic and conflictive and productive, transgressive, kind of violent relationship, the running track and uh, the library. Well, um, where are we? Over here. These considerations of um, architecture as constituted by um, space and events, by program, by conflict and violence, um, where space is defined by the body and the movement of the body. Um, this all required uh, new forms of uh, image, new forms of representation to, um, to describe. And this is another area in which um, Shimi's work is uh, extremely significant for us. You may recognize these images from the Manhattan uh, transcripts in which Shumi uh, takes excerpts of film, um, which is, of course, pure uh, event-filled space. It's moving. It um, tracks the moving body through space, often urban space. And um, Shumi samples film in order to um, extract um, passengers and sequences of movement, which he then uh, notates um, with movement notation, often drawn from um, dance or choreography notation, in order to try and extract from the continuous fluidity of a filmic sequence um, spatially describable uh, maneuvers and moves. And so we see this act of translation between uh, the film and um, the diagram. All right, I'm just having a bit of a technical move. Right. Okay, I'm still going. I think I'm still here. Yeah. Just lost the ability to see myself. Um, all right, and then, you know, there are many, many of these... Um, of these transcripts um, here where Shumi then uh, moves from the, uh, from the frame by frame analysis of uh, movement on film to uh, extrapolating diagrams and then from those diagrams generating um, uh, uh, 3D uh, sketches which still contain the traces of the diagrams. And so this is the attempt, which is to end up with a fully described three-dimensional architecture, which retains within it the structuring impulse of the body, whether it's the single body um, or bodies in conflict with one another or groups of bodies processing um, through space. So much for Shumi. Now, you're going to look through uh, one final iteration of this uh, problem or problematic of um, the body and architecture. And um, this will bring us up to the, 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 the contemporary and the point at which we want to start our discussions uh, when we meet in, in class. Now, in the examples that we've looked at um, already, um, 
there has been this idea that new kinds of architecture can emerge, or new conceptions of architecture can emerge from new conceptions of the body by returning to the body as the moving center of architecture um, we can re-establish the ground for a new way of life Corbusier did that um, in his exercise classes on, um, on the villa Claude Perron did it in his interiors and his habitable circulation um, Shumi did it in the um, uh, movement sequences and event spaces um, of his transgressive um, uh, kind of uh, filmic architecture um, one uh, further iteration is the work of um, Gins and Arakawa, Madeleine Gins and uh, Shisika Arakawa. And two um, speculative uh, architects who were working up until quite um, recently, they've both now um, passed. Um, and here have a body, an extensive body of um, speculative and imaginative uh, drawings, installations, artworks, landscape architecture, houses, apartment blocks, um, museum work, um, as well as um, extensive um, and highly kind of creative and provocative um, writing. We're just going to touch on it here as a jumping off point, but I encourage you all, um, if you wish, to, um, to explore it uh, further. But, you know, one of the um, key points here um, about Ginter and Arakawa's work is the way that they return to the body and the kinds of bodies that they look to to describe, to re-originate, to re-find a starting point for architecture. And for them, um, the child is a key, or even the baby is um, a, a key point as a kind of return to a, um, a state in which we might more purely apprehend the physical environment um, uh, around us. And they... Um, Let's see. Yeah, they formulate this um, this uh, notion, and I think it's um, it's quite a key concept here, which is the organism person environment. And here, this is perhaps an even more explicit extension of some of the ideas that were in Perron and Shumi, which is that you cannot separate a person from their environment, or indeed from their their kind of biological status as an organism, but the person exists. Um, as a biological organism who is inseparable from their spatial surround, from the environment um, which is around them. And when you look at some of their conceptual uh, drawings, you see, you know, the way that the body is conceived is as something which is lodged within and stuck and subsumed under the uh, kind of heaviness of the environment. So lots of their installations are ones which literally surround um, the body with uh, architecture and so that it's pressing up against it um, over every uh, surface. There's a very interesting um, dialogue in the selected readings that I've shared with you today um, about, <clears throat> um, about this uh, house. It's written in the form of a dialogue and the series of the characters go into what appears to be a heap of rubbish and they have to crawl down inside the uh, materials and then um, and then you see that um, when they get under there they realize that this heap of matter is in fact a house that can uh, live in and as they move um, it keeps um, changing volumes open with every motion every push every um, uh, movement of their arms um, the space around them um, takes shape and so um, you know, quite charmingly, the snail becomes the um, the kind of definitive figure for this new way of moving around the world, which is that you're sucking. You've got like a sucker on your body, which attaches to all of the surfaces of the world, and this um, this expresses and um, communicates the way that the human, the organism, person environment um, inhabits the world. That it's in constant tactile contact. Um, with the surface um, of the earth. And if you look through um, excerpts of their work, you see indeed that there's a very strong um, kind of uh, physical pressure 
um, uh, that's uh, that's applied uh, to the body by their by their work. It's also, <coughs> you know, it's also kind of an architecture on the oblique. You know, recalling Claude Perron, there's no horizontality. Everything is angled this way or that way, um, in order a bit like a, a labyrinth to induce a state of raised consciousness. This is key to all three of these writers and thinkers and architects, which is that destabilizing the body, defamiliarizing um, its spatial surround is a way of inducing a heightened consciousness, um, stopping people from kind of sleeping in the, um, in the kind of normative, generic world of most of the architecture that we inhabit waking them up with extreme acts of architecture, um, changing the nature of the floor, eradicating flatness, playing with texture, colour, um, inclined planes, um, uh, completely um, unexpected and labyrinthine, game-like, play-like um, uh, imaginary surrounds in order to induce new forms of uh, spatial uh, consciousness. We'll have more time to um, explore the work of Gins and Arakawa, but I just want to use it here as a, as a sort of bridge to the work of um, Amy Hamray and Kelly Fritch, which um, you'll have read for today, the Crip Techno Science um, Manifesto. Because what I want to uh, suggest is that to some extent, there's a, there's a pathway that we can trace from this idea of crypt techno science to uh, what is happening in um, Ginz and Arakawa and thereby connect it to this disciplinary genealogy that we've been looking at. Now, Amy Hamray and Kay Fritton are architects and they're writing from outside of the discipline um, of architecture, but they are thinkers about design They've been involved um, in, um, in the analysis and the mapping of, um, of the urban environment. And I think I sort of introduced them really here as a proposition, um, a proposition for a theory of um, movement, a theory of the body, um, for which there does not yet correspond a living architecture. And I think I sort of challenge you to think about this. Can we imagine a crip techno scientific architecture. Um, can we think of the idea of crip techno science um, as a um, as a, a new or another iteration of the problem of circulation um, uh, within architecture? A new iteration of the problem of the body, of the problem of movement and the relationship between the body, um, events, programs, and uh, spaces. Um, you know, the Crypt Techno Science Manifesto um, is um, very assertive about the world building and world dismantling uh, power of design um, towards the end of more socially just uh, relations. And it furthermore makes the case that um, uh, it's from a Crip perspective that we can redesign uh, the world. Uh, uh, Re rebuild the world or dismantle the world, whatever is necessary, um, uh, with this position of the, um, uh, 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 the crip body, the disabled body, um, at the forefront, to address the, uh, the ableism, the compulsory able-bodiedness um, of the majority of architectural um, design in history. And I think this would add a new layer and a new proposition, and this is why I kind of bring it into this story. If we think of it within the continuity of this architectural discourse on circulation, how can we take it in a new direction? How can we um, uh, deploy this rich history of spatial and architectural investigation into the body and space? How can we redeploy that now within our contemporary uh, context to produce um, new forms of collaboration, to give new representation and new awareness to the diversity and difference um, of bodies that constitute um, society, 
to give new visibility to those um, bodies who may have been um, uh, excluded um, or not given visibility um, uh, previously. And instead to embrace um, and um, welcome the kind of challenge that disability and crypt studies bring to uh, contemporary architecture as a, um, as a kind of license to be more bold and more experimental in the ways that we deploy um, uh, form, space, uh, in their relationship to uh, the body. So this is um, this is where um, I'll I'll leave uh, the lecture. Um, I hope that you've been able to um, to follow, and um, uh, I hope you enjoy reading the readings and look forward very much to seeing you um, in class on uh, when we when we see each other. So be well and um, see you soon.